and I think we both know what that are like. So I'm just going to throw out the, you know, the slug that we always use, which is um, film worker is the remarkable untold story of Leon Vitale, who gave up fame and fortune to serve for decades as Stanley Kubrick's right hand man. That's very succinct. And I have spent a long time trying to boil it down. So, um, you know, it's a lot more than that. But the reason that we wanted to make sure that upfront, just the way that the movie is constructed as well, is that this is, there are many people who worked with Kubrick. Uh, Stanley knew how to utilize people around him in ways that uh, was beneficial to them and himself and, you know, understood what the people around him were willing to do and what they were good at and what they weren't good at. And so with Leon, if you, since you've, most of you have seen the movie, Leon became, as they call, the jack of all trades and a lot of other things. Um, and it was a very fascinating thing to watch that unfold for us in the process of realizing how much he had done. How did you first get into movie producing and how did you get involved with this project? Okay. Um, well, I got into, well, I was a um, theater arts major in college something I, <laughs> anyway, I need not make any comment about that. I was a theater arts major, and then um, I wanted to go into acting, but soon found myself on the other side, which was a casting director, which I actually enjoyed a lot more. And then from casting, I uh, just kind of enjoyed being involved with film more and more, and I was really interested in being part of the indep independent world. So um, I became a producer, went to LA eventually after a long period of time, don't need to get into all of that, and became an independent producer. Was introduced to Tony Zera. And um, over time, we developed a partnership and uh, there was something about him that I felt like, okay, this guy's got the drive and the talent to make things happen. And so I, um, partnered up with him or came on board with him. And that's how uh, I got into, I was doing producing before, but that's how I got into the full documentary producing. So as I said, I've been involved with film or the film business for a long, long time. And this project, well, Tony and I had finished a documentary called My Big Break, and that took many years and has its own saga in itself. It's really fascinating. And during that time, I mean, Tony had always been obsessed with Kubrick. And I had also felt that way. I mean, I didn't have that level of complete and utter devotion to all things Kubrick that Tony did. But um, 2001 was probably the most influential movie I'd ever seen. And I saw it when it first came out. And um, I always loved Kubrick. Always, always, I just, you know, he's the master. And so Tony and I would talk a lot about Eyes Wide Shut as well as the other movies and all of Kubrick's career as we were making this other film. And uh, eventually that led to the decision to start the documentary about Stanley himself. So that was quite a few years ago and we set out to do an unbelievable amount of research, completely immerse ourselves. As all of you know who are involved with Kubrick, you start to go, <laughs> it is forever and ever and ever. It is unbelievable. You go in there, I'm surprised I'm out. I, I literally think like Stanley ejected me eventually going, okay, okay. You can see you're gonna like break under the weight of this. But, um, so we started this project uh, that was more about the arc of Stanley's life, Eyes Wide Shut it was an important part of this. And we went and we filmed with so many, so many Kubrick posse people and experts and got deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into this and the research and the preparation. And towards the end, we finally got, let's just say the password to the house and was able to connect with Leon Vitale. 
So this was, Leon was really close to being the last person we filmed with because it was kind of like, can we get to Leon Vitale? And we did. Um, and when Tony went down to film with him, he came back with about four hours worth of footage. And we watched the footage and there was a point where I, we were, we were looking at this and I just felt like this is an amazing story. This is an amazing story. This guy, you know, because I loved Barry Lyndon. I remembered in Barry Lyndon, I was like 14 when I first saw it. And I, you know, his performance stood out for me and I always remember it. And then to just see the arc and the stories he told and the whole thing. So Tony and I went back and forth for a long time. We were so deep into what's going to be SK 13 eventually. And it was like, do we stop and make this movie about this man? No, I mean, documentarians, as you may or may not know, it is brutal to make documentaries. And if you're already down the line and trying to finance it and trying to make it happen, and now you're gonna stop and switch gears. So we went back and forth about this a lot. And Tony was like, there's no way I'm stopping. And then he would think about it and go back. And then finally, I was just feeling like, oh, and there was one day I said, you know, I feel like if we don't do this, if you don't do this, somebody else is going to do it and you're going to regret it. You're going to regret that you didn't get this story. And so we reached out to Leon. He said no. And he said no. For him, it was like I could talk about, you know, in Leon's world, it was he'll talk about Stanley all day. He'll talk about Stanley for his entire life, but talk about himself. No. I mean, it was very difficult to get him to say yes, but he eventually did. And thank goodness he did. So that's how we got involved in this project, did a complete turn. And now Tony's continuing on with SK-13 and we finished Film Worker and I'm really glad we did because I honestly will say this. I don't know if Tony will agree or not, but you can always ask him. If we hadn't done Film Worker, we would not have been able to get the access or he wouldn't be able to get the access to a lot of things he's gotten the access to with SK-13 or have the knowledge or any of that. So Leon really was like the doorway into the deeper Kubrick world. So it's very interesting. What was your role as the producer? What does a producer typically do? Okay, <clears throat> this is a complicated question. Um, a producer, you know, producers do so many different things. This is why you will see in the end credits or the beginning credits, I should say, the above the line credits and the end credits, producers can do any number of things. They can be the people who bring the money. That tends to be the executive producer in film, but let's say on television show, it's that generally the showrunner. Um, with an independent partnership, what I did was everything that Tony wasn't doing. So Tony really was and is the creative driving force. And then all of the other stuff, I mean, and also I should give him the kudos for something else that's really amazing is that he, you know, does all of the technical work and not just like the editing and everything, but he learned how to do all of the technical troubleshooting, which makes it possible to be an independent filmmaker and producer team and make it happen. So anything else which deals with getting to the people, let's just say making, getting access to all those people that we had to film with and coordinating that and being a sounding board and being there to help push things forward. And if he would ask me my thoughts or my opinions, I would give them to him and we'd shape it together and he would have obviously the final say about all the creative work. But everything that isn't about sitting down editing um, is what I did. So that would also include getting all of the materials for the clips that are used, going through them all, logging them all, giving him a list of which ones I think he might want to see, um, and then compiling it. And then at the end, there's a lot that you end up doing because once you've finished with the filmmaking itself, you know, there's a lot of troubleshooting during that time, but then it's all about the release and the festivals and everything else and getting all of the rights cleared and fair use and everything. It's the non-creative um, part, but it's creative in a different way. In this case, because it was the two of us primarily, it really was like, you know, there's the creative side, 
find music for, you know, it's like, I need a piece of music here. I'm looking for this, go search through like a hundred pieces of music. What about this? What about this? It was always all like that. Once you decided to make film worker, how long was that? It was about four years from start to finish. Okay, and so I'm trying to remember if that meant finish in terms of getting it out there through the festivals or releasing, but I think from start to release, it was four years. Four years that felt like four decades, <laughs> just because the amount of work. What were a couple of the best or toughest moments during production? I'm gonna start with the best. Okay, if we're talking production. I would say for me personally, meeting Leon, and getting close to Leon and having him be a part of my life as more than much more than a subject, but as a friend uh, has been the most beautiful thing that I could ever have imagined. And I never did imagine. Um, just finding moment, being able to see something come together. The creativity, this is what I love about that work. It's like watching these moments where you just know, oh, that's going to be amazing when it gets cut in this way. Um, so I would say the whole process when you would just see something and you knew that was going to be used or being able to, I'll tell you one thing that was one of the most pleasurable things for me, tracking down Danny Lloyd and getting him to get on camera. That felt like as a producer, that was like, yes. Because, you know, some of you may or may not know, but at that point, Danny's out and about a lot more now. But at the time, he was basically, I want nothing to do with this. I'm a professor at his college. I don't even let my kids, my, you know, students really talk to me about The Shining, et cetera. So when he said yes, he would be, be in the film, it was really wonderful. It was great. Wow. And he did it because he loved Leon so much. And then also just watching Tony put things together and then the moments where it would just sing and flow, that was, that was beautiful too. But outside of production, I would say, I would say the highlight was when we premiered a can and got a 10 minute standing ovation, I will say, and Leon and his children were there and the children were so moved and they saw their father in a way they had never seen him before. And Leon was crying and the audience was, clapping for the film and clapping for him. And it was unbelievably moving. So that, that, that's a real highlight. And what was one of the darkest moments in that four year period? I would say, weirdly enough, the first thing that comes to mind, there were a number of things that were very difficult. Uh, but it was strangely enough, and again, I'm sure Tony would disagree, is when we found out we were going to the Cannes Film Festival we were actually gonna premiere that. And the reason for that for me as a producer was it's kind of like people, studios sometimes don't even go to camp because it's so expensive and it's so the logistics and it's just crazy. So for these people who are like this team, two people having to pull it together and it was, it was almost like you're in a small town and you're the best you know, on the track team, I'm not putting us down that way, but I'm talking about in terms of resources and everything. And then it's suddenly you're going to the Olympics. Okay, uh, how is that gonna happen? And that's so, so as that, that kept me up a number of nights. And I would have to say from there, the stress of having to perform in the larger world, um, we had been very insular, you know? We could run things the way we wanted to, but now it was going to go out in a way that we always dreamed of but there's a lot of pressure that comes with that too. And having to, listen, I, I can truly say this, um, you know, nobody is more driven than Tony and nobody is going to give them, you know, for, for him to be like doing work on Stanley Kubrick for years, <laughs> decades, and go deeper and deeper does not surprise me. So, he was going to get it to the point that he had to get it to, but it's under the pressure and the deadlines. And now my job had become cracking the whip, which I had to, or else we, you know, it's about delivering and things like that, which he was going to be able to do, but he wanted to, it to be finesse. I understood that, but I also understood the pressure. And I feel like I could have handled it better now, but at the time it was definitely stressful. 
to have to be going to that level so fast, you know, when you'd been absolutely steeped in nothing but the creativity and the personalized aspect of the work. Okay, I'll tell you a quick anecdote that talks about the producing. <laughs> so I'm a big animal lover. I love animals, you know, no shade to anybody who likes to hunt or anything, but I'm not into hunting. We went to meet Arlie Ermy to interview him, one of the last interviews. And he was unbelievably generous and kind. And he was just like, he was nothing like I expected. We ended up going to what was his compound out in, you know, the desert outside of LA. And it was unbelievable. I mean, this place, nobody would believe what, what was out there. I mean, every bit of memorabilia and, and knives and guns and weapons and, you know, everything. And he was fully living that life. And he was just such a gentleman. And then when we were done filming, he said, I want to show you guys something. So he takes us into this back kind of hangar and it's dark and he opens the door and he opens onto, I would say it was more stuffed dead animals than I have ever seen, even in the Natural History Museum. It was just like grizzly bears and lions and huge elk and buffalo. And that was all of his, you know, hunting trophies. And I, this was the moment I was like, you are going to keep this together? And I'll never forget, he pointed to this huge buffalo that was stuffed. And he said, yeah, that guy name was, I think it was Tuffy. It was like, uh, I, I don't know, it's like, he was a good old, they invited me to come and take him down because he was getting old and I did that. And, and I was just patting it and just going, wow, okay, you know? And just having to go like, put yourself aside, you know, don't start turning into, a, <laughs> and um, be a producer. So that was really funny, but he was, he was like an incredibly um, generous person. And I had to just swallow it and like look around at all these giraffes and everything else you could possibly imagine in his home. But that's the way it goes. Well, you said that almost all the creative decisions were Tony's. Yeah. Was there any ideas that originated with you that you're really proud of? Yeah, well, I would say, and I'll say it straight out, you know, that the original inspiration to say we need to grab this guy and make this movie was mine. So I don't like, you know, that's like, who cares? It's the way that Leon says, you know, he, there were things that he came up with. But when you're talking about being part of a process with a filmmaker, credit isn't really what you're interested in. But I do feel so good about the fact that that I was inspired, but ultimately it was Tony's decision whether he was going to do it or not. So that's what we did. You know, I could have wanted to do it for the rest of my life. And if he hadn't said, yes, I'm willing to stop, turn around and do this, it wasn't going to happen. So there was that. And then the other thing that comes to mind is really the, the whole beginning where you, you start to lay out Leon's life as an actor. Um, we were always going to do that. But there was some time when Tony's going back and forth with the editing. And for him, it's really about Leon as the film worker, as the one who, you know, gave everything and sacrificed everything, although Leon does not like to say he sacrificed, gave everything over to Stanley. And that was the focus. And, and so we did have a little back and forth on, no, you really, I really felt it was important to set it up as this was a man who had his own trajectory, his own life, his own big break, his own world as an actor and he could have just kept doing that. So again, I'm not taking credit for that, but I do remember we had some back and forth about it. And ultimately it was something that he, you know, did want to do in the end. Now it's sort of a follow up to that. I first saw it at the New York Film Festival, I believe at Lincoln Center. Yes. And then it was about six months later that I saw it on the Lower East Side and I felt it had been improved, but I couldn't exactly say what. Could you Say anything Absolutely. about it. Absolutely. Okay, so this goes back to the whole process of making a film like this. And also when you have somebody who is able to, when you have a director who's able to make his own, all of his own technical changes, and he's the editor as well and everything else, he's going to watch this. Again, when you do festival circuit, as a film, you're never, you're almost never going to see the same film you see at festivals, especially early on, 
that you're going to see when it finally is released. Because you do, and you know, Kubrick was known for this, like the whole thing about The Shining after it goes out and he's like, ah, you know, and then he's, he's a Rico and cut off the ending, you know, how, the whole thing. If Stanley had, was alive, he would still be tweaking things all the time because that's what that type of filmmaker wants to do. They're completely hands-on. So Tony was never going to stop tweaking it. I'm going to bet he'll go back to it at some point and make other changes, but, and he can't. He has the capability. That's the difference. He doesn't have to hire an editor to do it. So yes, he worked. We, the festivals were like, we either had to go out into that festival time and put it out as, as you know, it was, which was very good. But each festival, as if it was farther away, six months later, it was going to be a different cut. The beginning was different. Um, the music, of course, you know, music kept getting changed out. He would make trims, you know, shift uh, things around. And then that, what you saw was even different than what was finally released. Uh. So, um, yeah, each iteration, you know, he had a chance to tighten and improve. And of course we had to, by the time we released, we, we had to switch out most of that music that was in the original festival cut, because that's a whole different story. How much of a Kubrick fan were you before working on this project? And how did your opinion of Kubrick and his work okay. change from it? All right, that's a good question. So yes, as I said, I was a big Kubrick fan. Um, I was like, as they say, a super fan. Tony was a super, super acolyte fan. And, um, but I feel like my level of understanding him as an artist and as a businessman, uh, oh, it was like night and day. It's like getting a BA and going, oh, I got a BA in Kubrick studies. And then you're done with this and you've had like three PhDs. I'm not saying I know everything, but I'm saying like you just, it's night and day for years and it's never ending. As I said, there are people out who are watching this now who know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, um, and then of course, getting to know him more from seeing a lot of the memos and the papers and all of the stuff that Leon has. And also the biggest shift that happened for me with Stanley, which I think is very important for people to know about him as a filmmaker, is what Leon calls the organic process. Most people think of, of Kubrick, especially people who don't really, you know, who know who he is and like him, but don't really understand the process he went through, think that he was a super controlled director. Like you go in, you do, you know, how I want you to do it and I'm setting it up and that's how it's going to be. It was absolutely the opposite. He was an organic director. He said the, the, what's important about a film is the feel of it, not the think of it which is interesting because people think of Kubrick as totally, a lot of people think of him as just a completely cerebral filmmaker, but he, it was for him, it was how he felt, felt not so much emotionally, but the pull of the feeling. And he would do that with the people in the, the actors. One of the reasons he did so many takes, you know, there's the fact that he absolutely wanted the actors to know their lines fully to the point that they were no longer having to think about them but also he wanted to keep them going, keep them going and pull out more and pull out more to get to the place that he felt that's what I'm looking for. So he was very, very organic, not this like, here's the, um, you know, the storyboards and we're gonna, he didn't do storyboards. You know, he did concept art sometimes, but he was not that guy. And I think that is like a huge revelation. And then that continued through to the editing where, you know, that's when he felt he could really finally put it together the way he wanted to. So you yourself are a film worker like Leon. Did your experience as a casting director, like Leon sort of was, uh, and a film worker help you identify with him and the theme of the film? Absolutely. So I think why when Leon came, when I saw that footage, um, there was something about understanding him on some deeper level. That's the only way I can describe it. And yes, and I will even say that the dynamic, you know, it's like the macro and the micro. It's like the dynamic that was between me and Tony had a lot of um, interesting <laughs> similarities, um, but it's more because of the personalities involved. You know, it's, it's like, 
you've got somebody who has their vision and they just, that's, you know, when they're driven and they're going to do it. And then somebody who's trying to support that vision. And, and um, so I look at it, I look at film worker as so many different things, but for me personally, absolutely. I related to Leon. I completely related to Leon, but you know, I all, you can look at film worker as a, uh, there seems to be three ways that people give us feedback or gave us feedback. One is why would anybody do that? You know, why would anybody give up the, you know, this is like, what was that? Why did he do that? So those are the people who don't get it at all. I don't mean don't get the movie, but internally it's just never something they would think of. And even people like, you know, Lee Ermey and Matthew Modine say, oh no, I, I could never have done what Leon did. And then some audience members are like very stressed by this relationship. So there were those people. Then there were people who were very emotionally moved by it and felt like they completely understood that need to be of service to something that they perceived as greater than themselves. And that was a lot of people, very, very moved. And then there are people who see it like as a cautionary tale. And, you know, like, yes, you can get pulled into these things and give yourself over and feel that that was the right thing to do, but was it? And that's not for anybody to judge except for Leon to judge. Um, so I look at it as all those things. I really do at this point. I do too. And it's nice <laughs> you can shift between them. Yeah, yes. I, I learned a lot from doing this, this film. I learned a lot. And I'm ready now for other people to ask questions. Since we're a small group, I guess you can just jump right in. If you're not talking, please mute yourself just to keep the signal clean. I'll just ask one. Um, um, hi there, Elizabeth. Thank you very much indeed for this. Um, my name's Ian Roscoe. I live uh, in London in, uh, in the UK. Uh, and my, my Kubrick background goes back 40 odd years when I first saw 2001. But uh, absolutely, I mean, this, uh, you know, sort of got me addicted straight away. Um, I was fascinated to, to hear what you're saying about the background to film worker and that you've been getting involved in, uh, you know, did, get, contacting other people before the actual project headed right down in the direction of Leon. If you, if you hadn't been involved with Leon to the extent that you, you were, which direction do you think the film might have taken or might you have gone to other people and... Oh, you mean to, like to get a different perspective on him? Well, or yeah, because you, you were saying that it was essentially sort of looking up sort of bi almost biographically if. Uh, uh, or uh, the, I think you'd used it uh, uh, Kubrick himself using sort of a, an arc and time, as it were. Um, you mean so? Would it have gone a different way? Um, if we had not connected with Leon, like as a person, you mean like, you know, I don't think it didn't start out that way. I should be clear about that. It wasn't like we met and it was like, oh my God, Leon, we totally love you. It wasn't like that. It was right. more, it was really that there was a story about creativity and devotion and what we perceived as sacrifice. Um, and it was fascinating. It was like there was a subject and he was fascinating. He was, you know, somebody that you just, once we started to get into it and realize how much he had done, see, that's when it really turned because we knew he was part of Kubrick's, you know, inner circle, but we did until we opened the boxes of stuff that he had, we had no idea because he's not going to tell you that he did all of those things that we show in film work. He didn't. Oh, I was working and I did this. And then it's like, oh yeah, I remember I did this. And then you start digging through. You said, wait a minute, you were doing all of these things. Then it wasn't him talking. It was all the Warner people and the right. other people and the actors going, oh no, he did this or Danny. Oh, this was, I will never forget this or the, you know, Julian senior from um, Warner and the other execs all talking about Leon. So that's what led it deeper and deeper into wanting to talk about somebody who's unknown, but who really played an important role. Um, but still, you know, Stanley, it, it's almost like you flip the perspective. In the end, it became, this became, a, you know, Stanley became a character in Leon's story here. And, in the other 
in the next film, although I don't know, I mean, I kind of know where Tony's going to take it, but it, you know, Leon's just one of the people in the, who, who gives input. And it's now you're talking about the arc of Stanley. So I originally was intended just to be about Stanley and the arc of Stanley and you know, what led him up to the last project and all of these things. Uh, Hi, well, first of all, thank you for this invitation. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you to you, Elizabeth, for your contribution. I was quite impressed by watching the, your documentary. Thank you. And my feeling is that you can kind of come up with two different main feelings. One is the, that you feel impressed by the devotion of Leon Vitoli. I mean, he gave up almost everything. And if you hadn't made this documentary, possibly his legacy would, would have been forgotten. I have the question because in, in one part of the, of the do, do documentary, nearly on the second half, there's a, a very short amount of time, I, I guess a couple of minutes, where it is mentioned that uh, Leon wasn't invited to any gala related ceremony to Kubrick. He wasn't invited to any exhibition. I mean, it, it was like if he didn't exist at all, so I couldn't understand that. How, how would you explain that? Okay. Yeah. I mean, now, thanks to the documentary, we are kind of discovering that, um, that he made a lot of contributions that were totally unknown. And yeah. he didn't care. He was so humble that he didn't care. And he didn't see it as a sacrifice. So how would you account for that in, in your opinion? Okay. So that's a really good question and one that people often want to know and i do i want to work backwards which is to say the documentary um did bring leon's legacy into the light and so many things happened after that uh that we even have that tag at the end that says you know warner brought him back i mean leon has been the one who's been overseeing who saw over you know now had overseen the the new 2001 the Full Metal Jacket, The Shining, I think is coming up. I, I'm not sure right now, but he, you know, Warner came back in, acknowledged him, and he got inducted into the Academy and all sorts of things. So Leon is a person who is known. At the time when we met him, there was, after Stanley's death, you know, I still say it like this. On the Kubrick estate, it was like a king's court and Stanley was the king. And there are always factions and people who, you know, again, a lot of people worked for Stanley and everybody is kind of like, they're the one, because that's what Stanley was very good at giving them the sense that they're the one. And, but amongst each other, there may have been a little more tension. So at the time, I think it's important to, to, to understand that Leon had removed himself from the estate at that point. He was still working with Warner and doing some stuff with, with the estate, but he had pulled himself away. They had pulled themselves away. There was all sorts of stuff going on with them as people, which now is basically because of the film, etc. It's all good. <laughs> you know, a lot of things got healed up because of this film. And he did end up going to another like lunch that was for the film workers, basically, the people who were tied in Stanley, but not to the big gala, not to that big, you know, celebrity gala where there were all the people talking about him and Spielberg talking about him and all of these people. No, he didn't go to that. And he, just because you know what? It's also about, and this is something I have to remember to point out, it's about status in that business. It's about status. So, who is he? Unless somebody really knew who he was at the time, which they didn't, like we're supposed to invite the assistant to come to this gala. This is about celebrities. It's about above the line people. It's about the family. You know, it's like this guy, what, what? So that was part of the imbalance that happened that I feel very thankful to be part of writing that imbalance. Cause when Leon went back to Cannes, after we went in 2017, he went in 2018, maybe 2019, and he was then the one who presented The Shining 
restoration um, and was completely acknowledged for what he had done. So it was a good, it's almost like the, the ending of the film is really what happened to Leon after the film. So it was just one of those things, you know, Hollywood's about the status. I mean, I went to, an, I went to, uh, Tony and I went to a, an event that was a Kubrick based event at Warner. And this was before the movie came out. And there, Leon was on the panel, uh, Ryan O'Neill was on the panel, Malcolm McDowell was on the panel, and somebody else was too. Oh, Brian, the, 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 the actor played Brian from Barry Lyndon. And when they were introducing everybody, they introduced each person and then they said, and we have a very special guest here. And so we're sitting back there going, oh, they're going to say Leon because he hadn't come out yet. And it turned out to be, I may be getting this wrong, I'm trying to remember this, like, James Mason's grandson is with us in the audience. <laughs> and we looked at each other like, okay. You know, and that's what it's like. It's just like, what status you, and then finally it was like, and this couldn't be done without Leon Vitale, you know, this guy, he's going to come out. So if Leon had stayed an actor, he would have been brought out as Lord Bullingdon and Red Cloak mm -hmm. and given that kind of treatment. But because he was an assistant, he wasn't considered worthy of being with the celebrities at the time. Now he is. Yeah, okay. This has been so very, very interesting. Thank and you. I want to ask you a question. Uh, every project, every experience changes you in a, in a way. How did the experience of making Filmmaker change you? It changed me in so many ways. It really, really did. It made me understand the tenacity that I can bring to something. Uh, it made me understand my own creativity addiction, like we talk about in the film, you know, creativity is like an addiction. Uh, I don't see it as a bad thing. It made me understand that, you know, I still had a lot to learn, um, but it, it gave me the whole process. There was a lot in this process and, you know, working that closely with somebody, learning about your strengths and weaknesses together. Um, it taught me that even when you're down, you have to keep going because there were certain points before the release that there were things that were very difficult and it was still like, you have got to get all of this done or this movie isn't going to get out there. So uh, ultimately, I am so thankful for this. And I love to learn. I love to acquire knowledge. So I feel like I have another kind of thing that I know so much about, which is Kubrick and, you know, what could be better. Um, and yeah, I just feel like it was, it was uh, wonderfully bracing and also difficult. But I, I, I don't regret any of it. I don't. Who else? Hi, Mark. It's Mike. Woo. Hey, Mike. I love you, That's back. everything. <laughs> Elizabeth, great interview, really. I'm, I'm hanging on every word you say, really. It's just yeah. fabulous. I'm really with you. Um, I'm just wondering about what happened to SK-13. Is it going to be released? Okay, so that's a good question. Yes, it will be. Um, I'm not involved with that. I, uh, I was involved at the beginning. As I said, I was there, you know, in the inception of the idea and working through it and getting uh, most of the interviews. I'm sure there've been many interviews since I was involved, but I do know that Tony is working on it now and um, it's absolutely going to come out, but I don't know when. And it will be, if I, if I can say, I can guarantee it will be very interesting perspective and comprehensive. No, so. It's a difficult project, it, would, it seems to me. Very difficult. It's been going on for a long time. And as I said, it would have been out already if we hadn't done the film worker stuff in between and you know, made that film, that whole film. But again, I don't think the, the layering of that, uh, uh, it was perfect to do film worker first. If you're really gonna get deep into Stanley in ways that you, know, you, you need to, to really do something this comprehensive and to talk about his body of work and the arc of it, 
uh, going into it through someone who was there every, you know, not every step of the way, but at a certain point, uh, and seeing so much material, it made, it's going to make a very big difference, big did, difference in perspective. Did you get to interview any of his daughters? No, we did not interview the family. And, and that's something people ask. Well, we interviewed Leon's kids, but we did not. Um, now, Tony did show film worker to Christian and uh, Jan at, when it was done. So, uh, but we decided that, you know, there was a doc that came out fairly recently that really focused more on Stanley as the family man, things like that. But our focus really, we wanted to keep it more on Leon. And even though, yes, the family was part of his life and so were the other coworkers he worked with, we really wanted to kind of keep it narrow. And um, also, since I'm not in the Kubrick world that way anymore, I will say in some ways it's better, if you're gonna be super independent, you wanna make what you wanna make and not have it the perspective of people who have an emotional attachment, mm. uh, you know, as part of that. That was a big decision to do though, because we didn't know if that was gonna work for us or not, but it did. And it was, I do have to just share this with you. When Tony was showing the film to the family and he was texting me during it, he's like, they're just staring at it. You know, he was like, texting me, you know, and I was, he was in, uh, you know, England and I was back in LA. And he's like, okay. And then he would just like write this because, you know, he comes, he can be very, uh, you know, he's a very driven and brave person, but this was daunting. You know, you're sitting down with the family and you have no idea what you're going to get. Who else? Who else has a question? Mark, Mark, I had a quick question. First, yeah. Elizabeth, this is Jim Sherman, the cat guy. Uh, cat guy. <laughs> but, um, I wanted, first, I just wanted to second and say thank you for both to you and Mr. Zira. Did I pronounce his name correctly? Zira, yeah. Zira, okay. You guys bringing Leon's story to bed. I, I just personally really appreciate it. I felt the emotion. I, I cried. I mean, it was like, it was a really, really great emotion. But I wanted to ask you, what are you working on now? What's your next project, if we may ask? Um, you know, there's a couple of things going well. Of course, being in the film business right now or in any kind of production, everything stopped. Um, so, except for Tony, because he'll just keep going. So right. if, again, he can just, you know, keep doing the independent work he's doing. But since we're no longer working together, that was the end of that very long term partnership, I have sort of had to recalibrate. And um, one of the things I'm doing is focusing on my art, as you see here, and uh, especially the photography. But in terms of the film world, I'm involved with developing a number of projects right now. It's just that we're waiting for production to be able to open up, but I'd be focusing more on television now yeah. uh, than independent film. Cool. And great. I am doing some distribution with a, a friend of mine who's a, a, an independent distributor, so. Because the one, thank you for that. What I was just going to add to that was like um, one time uh, Francis Coppola actually said to me, and it's a long story how I know him. I'm not family or I'm not friends or anything, but um, a long time ago. And he said, I was interesting. He said, he does not begrudge anyone who doesn't want to go and do this. Okay. <laughs> and I thought that was like, and I've heard that from, I have friends who make documents, especially documentarists. I mean, th that is just a labor of love. It you is. don't do that. It you is. don't do that to get your mansion in, 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 you know, in Southern California or anything like that. Yeah, it's yeah. a labor of love. So good luck with that, ma'am. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you. Well, I do have to say that, as I said, you know, even though uh, we're not, Tony and I aren't working together at this point, I'm really interested to see what SK 13 comes out to be. And also, I'm so glad that the last project that we worked on together was this one, was Film Worker, because it means so much to me, and it was so beautiful and so well-received, and it changed my life, and it changed Leon's life, and I think it changed Tony's life, too. Yeah, it was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for it. Yes, John. Oh, hi, yes. I was wondering, usually with documentaries, people don't think about... Uh, creating a story, like creating the story itself. I think people just go, out, oh, there's film this footage, do interviews. Could you maybe talk about the construction of the narrative for Film sure. Worker, how that, how that came about? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so that is, the, that is the very interesting part about making documentaries. 
uh, you, you get, you have your idea or your subject, as you know, and in this case, since it's more of a biographical subject rather than a, a let's, a, let's say a social documentary where you're trying to talk about something that has to do with a, a cause or things like that. Um, you have to really get to know your subject. We shot for years with Leon. I mean, it, it took a lot, as, as I told you at the beginning, he didn't want to do this documentary. He really didn't. And he was so uncomfortable for a lot of the time. And then he finally softened into it. And so we had to take all this footage. I mean, un believable amounts of footage. The footage that we have is just ridiculous, or Tony has it now. Um, so piecing together a narrative, that's exactly the case. You look at the arc of this person's life. And that's why, you know, when we decided <clears throat> that, you know, him as a young, hip, Mick Jagger looking guy who gets his big break with Stanley Kubrick and who had been a big Kubrick super fan. That's the part also that we love. It's like he was a huge Kubrick fan before he, as a young successful actor, got his role in Barry Lyndon. So it was like just starting from there and then just going by film and then getting into sort of the family and what you're going to put in there and not put in there. You wanted to keep it targeted, but I will just say this one thing. You know, we had to keep figuring out how Stanley was going to come into the movie without overshadowing it. Because once you have Kubrick in there, that's it. I mean, he is a force of nature. So it was pulling back some stories, putting the focus back on Leon. Um, and then I, you know, I'm not giving anything away when I say this, but there's the end of the movie, the very end where he says, you know, when I, you know, I'm, I'm coming, Zarathustra, you know, and then what he wants to do is die on a flatbed steam back, you know, editing 2001. Um, that was shot in the middle of our long shoot. And Tony is a great interviewer and he kept trying to get Leon to this place of what we thought was the reality, which was his regrets. And it's like to kind of end it with this, oh my God, this just like he gave everything. He became the moth to the flame and his wings are just like, ugh, you know, it's like, this is so poignant. And Leon was not having it. He wouldn't go there. And he was just like, and he got more and more excited and his eyes lit up. And it was like, when he said that line, I'm coming Zarathustra, when we were done, Tony just looked at me, he goes, that's the end of the movie. So it's like, we knew that that was going to be the end. It was not what our intention was, but we knew that's how it had to end. So the whole thing arced from that towards that. I feel this is a real high point to end on, but also if you have anything else to add. I just really want to say again, you know, I was a little girl watching a movie 2001 that I had no idea what it was about. I was like 10 and it had such an impact on me. It's like, you can see my art back here. <laughs> it's like these images, this feel, and these are photographs, you know? It's like, I felt it as a child, even though I didn't understand it. And that's continued. And still to this day, that ending, when the star child turns when he, at, the, at the end, I, I can't even think about it without starting to cry, but I break down weeping like I did when I was a girl and I don't even, you know, Kubrick, he was a master, genius, complicated man. And I'm so, so grateful that I got to spend that kind of time with him. And also I'm grateful that he let me out because he doesn't <laughs> let everybody out. And that's not even a joke. So, um, but thank you guys. I'm really happy to answer any other questions or, you know, whatever you like and i appreciate it very very much and thank you for watching the film and for your feedback well this has been absolutely awesome and yes we have the messenger thread still if there's any follow-up questions and uh you can follow elizabeth on instagram to see her art thank you. Or, or on facebook uh but yeah thank you for agreeing to be the first guest zoom guest it's it couldn't have gone better Thank you so much. I'm so glad I figured out how to use Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk more, but I really, really appreciate you asking me and happy, happy, happy birthday.
<laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah. My best gift. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Great, Thank Mark. Thanks, you Elizabeth. Did, did great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Elizabeth. Good yeah. luck. Thanks, Elizabeth. Bye. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Bye.